How's it going everyone? Hope you all are doing well. So today I have a different type of video for you. Graph problems are a huge part of the technical interview process. So I thought it would be a good idea to give three tips for solving graph problems. And I'll be going through full examples for each tip to make sure that it's easily understood. So don't forget to like and subscribe if you want more content like this. And without further ado, let's get into it. All right, on to tip number one. So this tip is related to the breadth first search algorithm. This search algorithm is very popular across many different interview problems. And it's very important to know what data type to use when you're writing your BFS solution. So what do I mean by that? Let's jump into an example. So let's say we were to start off with a matrix with the numbers zero through eight. In many typical graph problems, the graphs are represented as matrices, where the numbers inside of the matrix are actually the vertices and the index neighbors are the edges. So if we were to look at node two, for example, that would be node two vertex. And the edges of node two would be the connection from two to one and two to five. And also if we wanted to include diagonals, we could also include node four, but for this example, let's only include edges as nodes that are horizontal or vertical. So that would just be vertice one and vertice five. So if we wanted to perform a breadth first search on this matrix, starting at node two, we would obviously need to utilize a queue. Now, in order to start this breadth first search off, just like how we discussed, we need to add all of the neighbors inside of our queue from our starting node. So in this case, we're going to add the positions of our neighbors. So we'd first add position zero one, which is corresponding to vertice one. And then we would add the position one two, which corresponds to vertice five. Now in many graph problems, you have to decide how you want to represent these coordinates inside of your queue. There are many different ways to represent these coordinates inside of your queue, but there is a very easy way to do this, and this is universal across any BFS problem. So first, let's go over all of the different ways that we can represent these coordinates. So one of the first ways is to just use a class, right? We could say class coordinate, and then we'd have an X and Y coordinate embedded inside of this class. Now, this will obviously work, but now you have a lot more boilerplate code to write. And in an interview, you know, you want to try to keep your code as concise as possible. So we can exclude this method. Method number two of representing the coordinates is we could just use a string, right? We can have the X and Y coordinate converted to a string, and then we have some sort of delimiter between our X and Y coordinate. However, the problem with this method now is when we want to convert our x and y coordinate back to their integer values, we now have to split on this delimiter and perform the conversion from a string to integer. Once again, this involves writing a lot more code, which is just unnecessary. So we can exclude this method as well. So the third way, and probably the most common way that I see being used, is just to represent the coordinates as an array. So this way is completely fine. However, the one problem I have with it is that once again, you're going to be writing a lot of code. You have to be initializing new arrays everywhere whenever you are implementing your BFS solution. And in an interview, you want to try to keep your code as concise as possible. You know, even saving an extra couple minutes could mean getting the job and not getting the job. So although this method is kind of the best of the worst, I would still exclude this one. And now for my personal favorite method for converting these coordinates, it is just to convert these two integer values to a single integer. So I'm sure you might be wondering, well, how do we do that? So let's go over an example. So what we're gonna do is add all of the neighbors from node two inside of our queue. The main idea behind this approach is we are going to take a 2D mapping to a 1D mapping. And in order to do that, we need to know how many columns we have in our matrix. So in this case, we obviously have three columns and our conversion formula from a 2D to 1D would be X times the number of columns plus Y. So if we were to attempt to add coordinate zero one, which corresponds to vertice one inside of our queue, we are going to take that position zero one 
and we're going to apply the formula. We're going to do 0 times 3 plus 1, which equals 1, and that means we can just add 1 inside of our queue now. Once again, we're going to add the neighbor of node 2, which would be node 5, which corresponds to the position 1, 2. If we apply the formula, that will be 1 times 3 plus 2, which equals 5, and that means we can add 5 inside of our queue. Now, one of the last things we're going to want to do is when we pull from the queue, we need to convert this 1D integer back to our 2D coordinate because obviously this 1D integer means nothing to us in the context of a 2D matrix. We need an X and Y coordinate in order to continue our BFS. So let's say we were to pull the number one from our queue. Our 1D to 2D formula would be the following. The row would be our index, the number that we just pulled from our queue, divided by the number of columns we have. And then the column number would be the index mod the number of columns that we have. So now with both of these formulas, we're able to do conversions from 1D to 2D and vice versa. So if we were to apply this logic to the number one, we would do one divided by three, which would be equal to zero. That's our row. And then we do one mod three, which is one. So now, as you can see, this number one, we've successfully converted back to our original coordinate of zero one, which corresponds to our number one vertice. Likewise, if we were to perform the same logic on the value five, we're going to do five divided by three, which would be one, and then five mod three, which would be two. And now we have the coordinate one, two, which corresponds to the vertice five. So although this method does involve the use of formulas, they aren't too complicated to understand and they will allow you to write far less code when you're implementing your BFS solution. On to tip number two. So this tip is also relating to the breadth first search algorithm and it's going to allow you to write your BFS solution in a much cleaner and faster way. Let's look at the same matrix and look at vertice number four. Vertice number four has connections to one, three, five, and seven. Now, just like we discussed, a breadth first search will have to check all of the neighbors, add them inside of the queue. And what that means is that we need to look in the upwards position, left, right, and down. And we have to perform that logic for every single vertice that we come across. So if we were to look at some pseudocode for a BFS, it would look something like this. We would first pull from our queue. So in this case, if we were to look at vertice four, we would pull the coordinates one, one. And now that we have those row and column numbers, we would then have to calculate what the left, right, up and down coordinates are. And now for every single direction, we're going to need to check if that position is even valid. If it is, we need to add that position to our queue and add the position to our visited set. So as you can see from this code where we're checking if the position is valid and adding it into our data structures, this code is duplicated across each direction that we're checking. And this is a very common way that I see people solve breadth first search problems. However, there is a much easier way to write this that will not affect your time or space complexity. So we have the old way on the left, and for the new way, we're also going to be utilizing Q as normal, and we're going to be pulling from our Q just like how we are in the old version. But now in the new version, the difference is we're going to create a 2D array, which will hold all of the directions that we're going to need to check. So these directions, the inner arrays inside of directions, is equivalent to the left, right, up, down in the old version that we initialized at the top. As you can see, they're essentially doing the same thing. For example, if we look at left on the old, it's saying that, okay, we want the row and column minus one. Well, if we look at the new version, if we look at the left array, all it's saying is, okay, the row, we're going to keep it at zero, but the column, we're going to subtract it by one. And the same logic applies for all of the other directions. And now once we initialize this directions array, we can then loop over each array. And once we extract each direction, we then append it 
to the row and column that we pulled from our queue. So now with this new X and Y value that we've just calculated, we can then just check if that X and Y coordinate is valid. If it is, then that means we can add it inside of our queue and add it inside of our visited set. So as you can see, the new way will allow you to reduce the amount of code that you have to write, and it's going to simplify the logic for you when you're implementing your breadth first search solution. On to our last tip, tip number three. This is relating to really any general graph problem, and that is to use your input to your function as a way to keep track of previous calculations that you've made. So once again, let's jump into an example so this makes more sense. So let's say we have the following matrix, and this matrix only contains numbers that are zeros or ones. And what this means is that our input to this function is actually restricted. In many graph questions, you'll find that the problem at hand is to search through this given input and maybe find the maximum of something, minimum of something, and it's usually on a restricted input. And as you are traversing through all of these nodes in this graph, you will usually have a set to keep track of visited elements that you have come across. So let's say we were traversing over this matrix, and every time we encounter an element, we would add those positions to the visited set. So in this case, we visit the position 0, 0. So we add it to our visited set. We visit 0, 1. 0, 2, 1, 0, and every single coordinate we add into our visited set to ensure that we don't go back to those positions. However, since our input is restricted to only zeros and ones, there's actually no need to even initialize a visited set at all. Let's say we were to loop over this input again, but instead of adding the coordinates to a visited set, we just change the element to something outside of the bounds of our restricted area. So in this case, to mark something as visited, we just change the current position to something that is not a zero or one. So in this case, we can just change it to a two. Likewise, when we go to position zero, one, we just mark it as a two, position zero, two, we mark it as a two, and so on and so forth. So pretty much this tip entirely boils down to if our input is restricted, then there's really no set needed. We can just use our input as our set by changing our elements to something that is outside the bounds of our restricted input. And this is definitely something that you would want to clarify with your interviewer to make sure that you're even allowed to do this. There may be a scenario where you are told that you are not allowed to modify your input and then this would not work. But if you can use it, this will actually reduce your space complexity because you don't have to initialize an extra structure. So that is it for this video, guys. I hope these tips were helpful for you. Graph problems can be a real pain to complete, but I feel like with these tips, it does make them a bit easier to manage. Also, if you want, I have a private Discord channel that you can sign up for on my Patreon where you can ask me questions and ask other people questions in our community. Well, that is all I have for you guys, and I will see you guys in the next one.